Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to the best animated shows ever, so far, with MC and Troy. I'm Troy. And I'm MC. And this and... is the best animated shows ever, so far, where we watch, discuss, and rate every animated show ever. Eventually, MC, I wouldn't know week to week Eventually. whose turn it was to, no, to do the do intro. I. And this has been, we've had a strange week of recordings lately, but y'all, we're back into it. We're going to get back in our rhythm, and we're doing it with X-Men. Yeah. I'm so excited. Uh, I am super excited to talk about X-Men. So, let's see. Question. How much did you watch this show as a kid? Uh, pretty much, I watched every single episode, uh, at least twice, I think, because I watched it not only when, um, it was all coming out, but, uh, then the repeats as well. Okay. Over the years. You might have me beat then, because I don't think I have seen every episode twice, but... I remember watching this one a lot as a kid. This this and uh, the Batman animated series were like the two superhero shows that I watched whenever I could. Anytime they were on, I'd be like, heck yeah, it's Batman time. Heck yeah, it's X-Men animated time. Um, and it's interesting going back and watching it because Batman I've watched a lot of as an adult. X-Men I have not watched much of since I was a kid. Did you ever go back and revisit this one? Or is this your first first time back in the X-Mansion? I think it's my first time back since I was a teenager. I think I was 15 the last time I saw this show. Okay. So Maybe it's 16. it's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. It's interesting to see how things like this age. Um, before we get into it, though, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff for this. I actually did a little bit of research on this one. Not too much, but a little bit. Um, this was actually the second major attempt at an X-Men animated series, which I thought was really cool. Uh, There was a pilot that they did in 1989 called X-Men. Okay, MC. The title of this show was not just X-Men. It was Pride of the X-Men. But but Pride was spelled with a Y because it was going to be a show where Kitty Pride was going to be the central character. Okay. Um, but apparently, apparently it's bad. The pilot, I think I might try and watch it for next, uh, episode. (laughs) Um, apparently it's not good. Um, so basically that happened and they were like, no, we're done. Listen, we've kind of had an expanded Marvel animated universe since 1978 and, uh, pride of the X-Men just killed it. Good job, everybody. And, and then three years later, they ended up coming out with this show, which kind of kicked off a new Marvel animated universe. So uh, the, the Fantastic Four, Iron Man, Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk, Spider-Man Unlimited, Silver Surfer, and then up to the Avengers United They Stand were all shows that had some interconnectivity with this show, just like we saw on the DC side of things with Batman and Justice League and Superman and all that. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Um, one of the other things I saw that I think is really interesting about this is uh, we talked about how... Um, this kicks off with a two-parter, right? Like, ah, sweet. Because I like when it's story. I like longer stories. So two-part story, very, very cool. It turns out it's not a two-part story. It's a 13-part story. The first season is 13 episodes, and all 13 episodes are interconnected with each other. There's actually, like, ongoing serialized storytelling happening in this show. And this was, like, one of the first Western animated shows to do ongoing serialized storytelling. Because, you know, animes do that all the time. But yeah, Western cartoons, they just they don't think kids have the attention span, I guess. Well, I guess there's still a lot of like that episodic uh, sort of ideal in um, today's Western cartoons as well, especially mm-hmm. with SpongeBob. Right. Yeah. Stuff like that. I mean, that's well, I mean, SpongeBob, well, SpongeBob when is you really not the think... kind of show that would have serialized storytelling. No. Well, also Looney Tunes. Yeah. Like you think back, Flintstones, uh, yeah, the Jetsons, true. That's... 
like it's children's cartoons in the in the west are like yeah it's just it's it's a 20 minute one and done story yeah and then you move on to the next one i like this so much more i love serialized storytelling it makes me so happy yeah apparently that didn't last it, the whole way through the show like by season three they started doing more episodic stories but i really like that the first season is like like you 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 apparently have to watch it in order or you will miss things well it, it's one of the reasons why deep space nine is my mm. favorite star trek mm. you said the words mc mm. yeah um i have one one last note for behind the scenes that made me laugh um <laughs> so this came out in 1992 uh batman the animated series had been out for a couple years when this came out yeah and batman the animated series is very good but the people making this show they they, they pooped on it so good behind the scenes because in in their uh offices apparently in discussing kind of the the tone that they wanted for this show they said that they wanted to be like really action pack and exciting and stuff. And they said, listen, our show is going to be hard rock, not like Batman, which is cool jazz. <laughs> I just, right? Like, I mean, cool so jazz? I thought about it. I will, if you think about it, uh, the Batman animated series is a lot more like uh, introspective, a lot more like plodding, thinking about, hmm. But I yeah, would not call uh, it cool jazz. <laughs> no, I, I I would think suspenseful. Yeah, suspenseful jazz is that a genre yeah. I can play on Spotify? I'm not sure. Hey, everybody who's listening at home, Alexa, play suspenseful jazz. You're welcome. You you, you really shouldn't say that because you you have accidentally started playing music in a couple in of in my episodes. own home. <laughs> That's true, but in the room I'm in now, there is not an an Alexa. I had to think about it, make sure there there is only a different smart home device whose names I will not invoke. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, MC, should we get into uh, X Men episode one, Night of the Sentinel, part one? Uh, we probably should. Well, uh, we will. But first, we should listen to these ads. Oh yeah, right after these messages. Hello you beautiful YouTube watchers. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to like and subscribe. And we're back. There we go. There we go. Uh, MC, this episode premiered on October 31st, 1992. Fun story I didn't get to in the behind the scenes stuff. The uh, animation studio that did this show, very, very bad. This episode was apparently all kinds of messed up when they got it so they had like th it was supposed to come out in september and then it got delayed to october and then when they finally got it it had quote hundreds of animation errors that the studio uh the animation studio refused to fix um so <laughs> basically this aired on october 31st 1992 but it was considered unfinished when it aired uh, oh my god so so these two episodes this one and episode two aired together uh October 31st, 1992. And then it reared uh, sometime in 1993 to actually kick off the season. And they had gone through and fixed all of those errors. So the version we watched, I'm pretty sure, is the, the fixed version. <laughs> after they got them to, to fix hundreds of animation errors. <sighs> hundreds. 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 Damn. I can hear a ringing phone. Oh, you can what? actually hear that? It, that that was downstairs. Uh, my parents currently aren't at home, and it's twelve thirty at night. I'm not answering Who's the phone twelve thirty at night. That's weird. Um. All right, MC. Let's get into it. I don't want to talk about the opening credits. Um. We're gonna have our our guest will be on on episode three. It's looking like, and I want to save the the credits talk for when he's here because I feel like you okay. might want to talk about the credits. So right into it. What do we got? We got Sabretooth. He's picking up a car. He's throwing it around. He's on TV. Yeah. Uh, it's a news report. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, about uh, how all the mutants are coming out, I guess. Yeah, that there's and... been like growing, growing, uh, growing rate of violent attacks in downtown, and the perpetrators seem to be mutants. Oh no. Yeah, and then, um, we get a scene with uh, Jubilee's uh, foster parents. Foster uh, parents, yeah. Yeah, they 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 that comes up later. Uh, at, at this point, I don't think they mention it until a bit in to the episode. But uh, at this point, you just think that um, they're kind of shitty parents, I guess, because yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's the thing you always see in an X Men story where. It's the parents going, oh, no, our kid's a mutant. What do we do? And what the dads decide to do is to contact the mutant control agency. And he's like, it's OK, honey. They're they're good people. They're just going to they're just going to help her. I can't believe our daughter's a mutant. Um, they do say something about like, are you are you like disappointed that we took her in or something like that? And yeah, he's like, of course not. We just need to get her help. And unfortunately, Jubilee was listening in on the conversation and she left before that part. So she just thinks her parents hate her. It's really sad. Yeah. And um. Uh, he talks about her blowing up the VCR, I guess. <laughs> look what the look what she did to the VCR just by touching it, and it's like burnt. Uh yeah, and Jubilee's like, oh, they don't like me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, then we get to see our first look at a sentinel. Oh man, there's a big thing flying through the sky. What could it be? It lands outside her house. Really big feet. Listen, okay. Okay, uh, uh, I'm normally okay with the Sentinels, but there's uh-huh. a scene in here where it attacks a dog that's barking at it, and I'm just like, no, okay, no, that's no. not on at all. No. <laughs> I, I Like, no, normally I, I just feel sorry for the Sentinels because the X-Men keep just, like, destroying them all. I mean, they're not sentient. You don't have to feel no. sorry for them. They're murder bots. <laughs> Man, that's true, um, they, but they normally just getting uh, their heads torn off. <laughs> this thing, it's like fifty foot tall. It punches a hole in oh. the wall of her house and grabs her bed, and then is like, "No organic life initiating tracking." It, it's and... not really fifty feet tall because its head's barely touching the roof of a two story building. So, listen, it's like. You know what the Sentinel's 25. mutant power is? The Sentinel's mutant power is the ability to drastically change height from one shot to the next. It's so weird. Uh, but uh, apparently Jubilee's not uh, in her bedroom, which yeah, she's ran away. the Sentinel puts his arm through the wall. Here's my question, though. Okay, so you're a parent, and you're like, oh, I've heard of this Bob down at the plant. His, his kid was a mutant, and he called the Mutant Control Agency, and they did a good job helping him out and stuff. That's not the story you're going to hear. You're going to hear like, yeah, Bob at the plant, his kid was a mutant, and he called the mutant control agency, and then a giant robot came on, pushed, punched a hole in his wall, and his kid disappeared. Is Jubilee like the first kid being abducted by the mutant control agency? I'm not sure. Uh, can otherwise, we just hold on for a second? Uh? I heard a noise downstairs. I just want to check. Oh, grab a baseball yeah. bat. <laughs> I'm kind of freaked out now. I don't know how to call 911 for Australia. Nor do I know MC's address, so I guess even if something happened. Oh man, this is terrible. You ever do that thing where you, you think you hear something in the house? I did this the other day. I thought I heard something in the house, and I, I got it, my baseball bat because I keep a baseball bat next to the bed. Uh, I got my dog. I wandered through the whole house, looked everywhere, couldn't find anything. Wandered uh, downstairs, wandered through the kitchen. Even went outside and checked the garage, couldn't find anything. Next day, we realized that uh, a picture had fallen off the wall uh, and slid behind some shelves, and so that was the the sound that I had heard. So it felt good to know that I was vindicated and that there was a sound that I heard um, and that it wasn't a criminal. Okay, I'm back. It wasn't uh, downstairs. One of the cats is next door. Oh. In my sister's room. 
Ah, okay. Them bounding around is what I heard. <laughs> Cats will do that to you. Yeah. Scared the living hell out of me because I'm at home alone. Well, and uh, so MC, I was just discussing with our listeners while you were gone. I have no way to contact like emergency services for you if something happened. I oh, was no. Like, I, I don't know what number to call. And even if I did, I don't know what MC's address is. Shoot. Oh, no. <laughs> if something happened, I know I'd just your be address. sitting here going, don't, don't hurt him. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I, I, I'm sure you would be able to find out. I'd like find your sister on Instagram and be like, hey. Yeah. It's taken me 38 minutes to find you, but there's an emergency. Oh, a- anyway, back to um, giant robots and. May- is Jubilee the first one being ad- adopted? We-, we we don't really know. We're- yeah. What's happening elsewhere? Uh, we, we... I'm just not sure why people would be trusting the mutant control agency if their first response to a mutant showing up is to punch holes into the walls of your house. I mean, yeah, there's that. But uh, m- maybe if uh, this is happening in multiple places all at once, it makes a lot more sense. Oh. Because this is like a coordinated abduction yeah. campaign. Like they they get enough names, uh, like they have so many Sentinel robots, they get that many names, mm-hmm. and then they send out the Sentinel robots all at once to collect all these mutants, and they're uh, because apparently they're getting signed up and put on this list. Yeah, I mean that 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 might make sense. Might explain how they're abducting people without it becoming like a major news story. Um, yeah, but it's going to become a major news story because the 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 Sentinel is tracking Jubilee, and she's done what any teenager does when they run away from their parents in 1992. She's gone to the mall. Yeah, Let's specifically to, to the, the arcade. Yeah, man, I miss arcades and malls. I miss arcades. Ah, uh, uh, there's an arcade in a mall near me. Is there? Yeah, my sister you know took me to it. Becky's never been to ground control. I think maybe I might need to do a field trip to ground control. I love the pinball machines that are on the second floor. Mm -hmm. They remodeled. Uh, Ground control is a a barcade in Portland. It's an arcade and also a bar. And my, I might take my pregnant wife there. She wouldn't be drinking that. We just be going for the arcade part. I mean, there is times when it's just an arcade and they're not serving alcohol i'm pretty sure i think you can always get alcohol there last oh, time okay. i went i took i took my nephew because they, they've like expanded a bunch so it's no longer 21 and over it's it's oh. kid friendly uh so i like i took my nephew uh when he was he was probably three i took him on like an, an uncle play date and we went downtown and went to the arcade and got hot dogs it was very fun it was a good time anyway I was seeing- I'm trying to remember the last time I was in ground control. I mean, you haven't been in Portland in quite a while, so it's probably been quite uh, a while. Yeah. Well, I think it was 2015 or 16 that I was there last. Yeah. But I think it was the time before that that I was last in ground control. So I'm thinking around 2014. It's been a minute, my dude. Yeah. Next time you come, you can you can you can do an uncle play date with my baby and take him to ground control. Fair enough. You yeah, you can yeah. be like, "Hey kid, come play X-Men arcade machine." Oh. oh. Tuesday nights used to be like Wednesday. free Oh. I think it's I think it's first Wednesday of the month. This is, this yeah. is Hey Ground Control, sponsor us. Uh Yeah. They free do, play night. Oh. Free play night. It's so good. So what they do is all the machines are set to unlimited quarters. And so you can just sit there and play all of the X-Men arcade game. It's the only way you'll ever beat the X-Men arcade game in an arcade. So you got to go on free play night. One of the reasons that we bring up playing uh, the arcade games is because there's this great scene right now that Jubilee's mm-hmm. about to have where right after she destroys the machine she was playing on, the manager or owner of the arcade walks up and goes, do you know how much that game costs? And Jubilee says, yeah, a quarter. And then... 
and, and, and then she has to run out of the place. MC, listen, you've done a great job of getting us back on track, but I have one thing I have to say about the X-Men arcade game. What? Have you ever noticed that the costumes aren't quite right in the X-Men arcade game? Yeah. It's because it's not based on this show. It's based on that pilot that I was talking about. It's based on a oh. different X-Men cartoon. Well, that that makes that a whole lot of sense because uh, there's... One or two characters? I, I I didn't go back and look at the roster, but yeah, yeah, apparently apparently the game is based on Pride of the X-Men, not on the show that we are currently watching. Crazy. Weird. Uh, so, Jubilee runs away from the arcade. Sentinel shows up at the mall, bashes a big hole in the wall, and Jubilee's, while she's running around, she runs into two girls. Oh, who's that? That's right. It's it's freaking Storm and Rogue. She runs into yeah, it's Storm and Rogue. noted X-Men out for a shopping date. Uh, we also see Gambit here because Storm and Rogue are out shopping while Gambit is out like shopping for a lady because Gambit well, is he's buying cards and the lady yeah like, he he's I buying like more buying stock. <laughs> it's, uh, Ga- Gambit's my favorite. Gambit was my favorite, and then I watched this episode and I'm like, Gambit, you creepy because he's like, oh, I like to play solitaire unless I have someone to play with. And I'm like, oh, Gambit, <laughs> dude, and, chill and out. And he keeps calling Jubilee petite in this. Yeah, yeah, he's 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 a little much. I think I, I still, still like him. Character, but his I didn't need to see Gambit flirting. But here's the thing, Gambit flirts exactly like you would expect Gambit to flirt, but I didn't actually need to see him do it. <laughs> uh oh, it's just uh, he's just a little much. He, it, it it's. Uh, I'm just remembering things from the show now that 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 was like that wasn't troublesome. That might be now. And, oh well, yeah. Um, I mean, it was the early '90s. There's yeah. gonna be there's gonna be content that is problematic. We know that. Uh, MC. Yeah. There's a big fight scene. Everybody's oh, fighting a robot. Yeah, They're doing such uh, a good job. Well, we it's, see it finds Jubilee in the front of the mall after it's uh-huh. broken through the wall and she's trying to get out or whatever mm-hmm. and, and storm storm is like i command you as storm queen of the weather to release her and like rips off her normal outfit and she's somehow somehow has her x-men outfit underneath her less revealing normal outfit i'm not sure how yeah that works, but no, oh well. I, I'm, I'm not sure it, it, she's like wearing black uh slacks uh turtleneck or like no i don't think it's a turtleneck i just think it might be a shirt but she's also wearing like a red jumper or jacket oh, was she was she like fully covered up where it would make yeah. sense that she had that outfit underneath okay yeah oh i guess she was it's rogue that's wearing like the, the yeah the little pink dress. dress yeah but the way that like the electricity and like she has like these these big flowing cloak as well that, <laughs> that's part of her outfit like where the hell did, was that under all of that yeah i guess that's true um but she zaps the robot and rogue flies up and punches the robot into the face and jubilee is like did you see that and storm's like yes rogue has a way with men and i was like i dig it i like that line that's fun yeah okay uh and then uh gambit joins the fray and he's like i'll protect you Gambit will save you, and Jubilee's like, I'm running away, and then uh, the Sentinel's about to smush Gambit real good, and Jubilee zaps zaps the Sentinel in the face, and then stumbles outside where she sees Cyclops, and he's like, I'm pretty much Superman, hit the deck, madam, and she's like, I'm passing out, and falls over. More like Captain America. Yeah. Yeah. That that that'd be the better comparison. Like he is supposed to be all goody two shoes and yeah, except way less interesting. Yeah, listen, I'm not treading but... new ground by 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 saying Cyclops is kind of not my favorite X Men. Everybody knows Cyclops. He's, He's just kind of boring. boring. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Jubilee passes out and then she wakes up, hooked up to oh, all kinds of mysterious monitoring machines, and she explodes one of them because that's what she does. Yeah, pretty much. 
she puts fireworks in everything apparently i had a uh, a book version of this story when i was a little kid i had like the 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 like little golden books version of x-men night of the sentinels and, okay uh i probably read it like before i watched the show because the show came out when i was three so i probably read that book or had that book read to me uh more than i've actually seen any x-men episode because you know when you're a little kid and you get fixated on a book it's like hey read this book to me six nights a week and on the seventh night read it to me twice uh so for that reason um like i said i really like gambit a lot but jubilee is up there on my list of favorite x-men just because like she was the one i knew really really well from reading that book over and over again yeah and like after she like blows up the equipment she like sneaks out of the room she's in Mm -hmm. and immediately professor x like there's a trespasser uh, and we get to see like the powers of everyone on the x-men team like in this okay. little scene so she's creeping through and she sees beast and she sees morph and uh and then and then she like she reveals herself it's not important and and freaking freaking professor x this is not patrick stewart professor x because patrick stewart professor x would never have done this because patrick stewart professor x was a nice guy it turns out that my memory of professor x is clouded because i'm remembering patrick stewart professor x because this guy's like hmm here's here's the thing gene gray uh earlier today um we found a girl who was being chased by a murderous robot she passed out and so we brought her here and chained her to a table by herself in a room with no one around and no explanation. And now we found out that she's wandering through the mansion on her own. Um, so, you know, what, what What? Patrick Stewart, Professor X, would probably do would be, like, reach out to her telepathically and be like, hey, you can hear me in your head. It's a little freaky, but don't worry. We're friends. I really want to help you. Um, what I'm thinking we should do instead is just turn on, like, every alarm that we have at maximum volume and start screaming intruder alert just to make sure that she really feels like she's in a dangerous situation and doesn't at all feel comforted or safe yeah and she it's not like that will make her like freak out and run into a room that um may or may not be dangerous yeah it may may or may not be some sort of a danger room oh yeah that was dumb, and, but I'm I'm, uh, I'm 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 proud of you. It's good. Ah, uh, it it's so silly. She breaks into it by zapping the control panel, and then when she gets in there, she's confronted by Wolverine, and uh, then all of a sudden Gambit's there fighting Wolverine, and then yeah, she takes well, it out says, Wolverine. It says, it's, it says it's the the Gambit Wolverine training program. Yeah. And then um, when Wolverine's on top of Gambit, she, like, smacks him across the room. Mm-hmm. And then everyone else shows up. Because she wants to save Gambit, because Gambit's her friend, and she doesn't know who Wolverine is. He's just some short, smelly guy. Is he canonically smelly, or did I invent that? I know he's you canonically short. That. Oh. Well, look at him. Doesn't he look like he'd be smelly? Uh, he I just mean, looks like he, he'd stink. He's hairy. Yeah. Here's another fun fact from the Pride of the X-Men cartoon. Uh, one of the things that um, that the uh, creators of or the executive producers didn't like about that show was that um, there was a dragon sidekick because Kitty Pride does have a dragon sidekick. I forget what his name is, but it's a little dragon that flies around with her. He's very cute. Uh, and that was in the cartoon. But also it said that they didn't like Wolverine's Australian accent. Which he's is interesting. supposed to be Canadian. But, because he's supposed okay. to be Canadian. But years later, who who would get cast as Wolverine and become the defining figurehead for Wolverine? Why? Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman, an Australian. Ooh. Who was absolutely had the right like facial features and hair mm-hmm. for the, the role. But he but is like, like six, six foot eight. Yeah. He, <laughs> he's, he's a like big dude. Six one, six two or something. <laughs> Like, he's massive. He's, like, a foot taller than Wolverine's supposed to be. Like, Wolverine's Wolverine only be... supposed to be 5'2". Five 5'2", two. Five, five, five two tops. Not 6'2". Yeah. Not, not like, Wolverine towering over everybody. And uh, Hugh Jackman doesn't look nearly stinky enough. Just personal preference. Like, Hugh Jackman, I feel like, would smell like... Uh, hmm, hmm. MC, what do you think Hugh Jackman would smell like? A pine forest. 
A pine forest. I like that. I feel like there'd definitely be a like a musk there, but but like a really satisfying musk. Not not like stinky, but like um a pine tree with a ferret in it. Yeah, yeah, there'd be there's there's some kind of an animal smell that I feel like yeah. has to get mixed in with with the uh the pine tree smells. Like maybe maybe like a pine tree. No, you know what I think he'd smell like? I think he'd smell like a steak that was burned over some pine coals. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, Storm is like, hey, we're the X-Men. It's cool. Check it out. We can use these powers. It's really a dope place to be. Xavier is nice, even though he seems like a jerk who turns and turns alarms on his guests. Uh, it's all good. Um, just this hang out with school. us and everything will be fine. And Jubilee's like, sweet. I'm going to do my superpower and run away. It, yeah, she she's pretty much like giving the rundown of the school and being like, we're the X-Men, we're supposed to help humanity, we, we can also teach you how to use your powers. Mm-hmm. And that... It, it, which is essentially what you think uh, the X-Men would do anyway. But yeah, she like... It's a good mission statement for the school. Like, yeah. this is the school's obviously going to be an important part of the show, and I feel like that's a good, uh, in, excuse me, a good introduction to like here's what the school is for. I like and that. then we had the boring meeting about mm-hmm. Jubilee <laughs> it, staff meeting. Yeah, yeah, it's they they wait, sit around like wait. all these computers and everything, and it's just I, like I just have to give credit real quick. Meeting staff meeting is. Have I have have we staff meeting on this show before? I don't think so. Okay, so there's this show called Dork Trek that watched all of Next Generation, and now they're watching all of Deep Space Nine. This is a very good podcast. If you like Star Trek, you should listen to Dork Trek. Um, but in Next Gen, they realized that all the freaking time in Next Gen, there was staff meetings. And so every time one came up, they would go, staff meeting! And th- that would be the staff meeting part of the episode. So... I'm I was surprised watching... if I've never done it before, but I'm just warning you now. I'm going to start doing it. Anytime we're watching a show and there's a staff meeting, I'm going to call it staff meeting. I'm not joking. I was watching um, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation earlier today. Mm-hmm. It's the episode where Q sends them out into the, uh, further out into the universe and oh they gosh, meet the, the Borg for the... Borg. Yeah, the Borg's first uh, introduction. And, and it was like that episode... And I swear they have like three staff meetings in that <laughs> episode. That is and, that is and definitely Q... high on the staff meeting list because they're like, we can't go anywhere. We have nowhere. Yeah. Like we can't fly. Just have a staff meeting, I guess. But it, it's always funny because Q keeps interrupting the staff meeting. That's like five people, and one of them's uh the lady from uh, it, it's Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, she's. It starts Guinan. with a G, but I can't remember her name right now. Guinan. Guinan, that's it. She's like a super ancient like being that's not actually human. Uh, she's an Alorian. Okay, a listener. There we go. They're a race of listeners. So there we go. Who we were almost from wiped Star out Trek. by the Borg. My nerd is showing. Uh, do you know that she's she's the same race as uh as um. The guy from Star Trek Generations, Malcolm McDowell's character. He's also an alien. Yes. Because that's when she showed up in the continuity of Star Trek. Um, out of the after ribbon, yes. she hung out with Mark Twain for a while, she then got on a spaceship with Malcolm McDowell and got lost in the ribbon. And then also there's an Alorian who shows up on Deep Space Nine at one point. He's the guy who has the little machine that makes luck change, and it's a gambling device. And then yes. he opens his own casino. Also an Alorian. Anyway, this has been your Star Trek Minute with Troy and MC. Now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Um, MC, this is the part that I was talking about, because Jubilee's running away. And yeah. she's like, I gotta get home and make sure my parents are okay. And she runs by a building, MC. And I'm just gonna count stories real quick as we pan up one, two, three, four, five, six stories. And the Sentinel's head is sticking up above the top of that six-story building. And he's hiding behind the building. And she ran right by him and didn't see him. This is the I sneakiest mean... sentinel ever. He he got a crit on his stealth roll there. Because a, 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 he's taller than a six-story building. He should not be able to hide anywhere. I mean, before that, we get this small scene of the guy from 
the mutant oh, right. outreach the mutant thing, control talking agency. with Jubilee's parents, and yeah. they're like, th- this is where we definitely hear that uh, she's only been with them for about a year. Mm-hmm. And they're like, we and... don't know much about her friends because she's only been with us for a year. And I'm like, hey, talk to your foster child. She's been with you for a year, and you're like, yeah, we don't really know anything about her, or her friends, or hobbies. Uh, we know she likes I... to blow up electronics. So is that helpful? Or I don't yeah. think that building's six stories tall. I counted the windows, MC, and one of those only... stories was a big window. I only see four. Count them again. Yeah, um, I I only see four. Okay, so it's only four stories tall and it's hiding. <laughs> um, so then uh they're like the uh the staff meeting the X-Men have, they talk about how oh my they God. figured out <laughs> what? The building changed like from the the scene that I where you see a run past uh-huh. There, there's a it's a building with like windows with bricks between each window sort okay. of thing. Uh, uh, like there's a bricks between the windows on some of the floors, and it's only like four tall. And then it cuts back to the um sentinel, and there's like this massive building with like square windows all up along the side of it, and it's like several uh floors tall, like you were saying. So that's weird. Well, that makes sense. I I, I mean. Like, this show's animation is... The, the the movement of the animation is good. The designs, some of them are, you know. It is it's, what it is. And then he shrunk back down to, like, only being, like, <laughs> two stories tall. Oh, I told you, I, I that's don't... the Sentinel's mutant power. Um, So the Sentinel catches Jubilee, and the X-Men realize that the Sentinels are working for the mutant control agency, and they're like, it's probably not the whole mutant control agency, it's probably just, like, one guy named Trask who's an asshole, and so we should go break in and steal their database so that they can stop abducting children, which is a good thing to do. Um, And we get a cool scene here where uh, we've got Beast and Morph and Rogue and Gambit um, and... Storm and Cyclops, I think, all going out. Basically, everybody going out to this mutant control agency. And there's this nice conversation where they're all, like, comparing stories about what it was like to grow up as a mutant. And, like, you know, I at least you didn't get fur when you went through puberty and, and stuff like this. And it's this nice, cute scene of, like, uh, you know, the, the, the thing about the X-Men. I think the thing that makes the X-Men special is that the X-Men are... Um, a metaphor for teenagers, which most super ho- superheroes are in some way or another. But they're also like, there's a a a, an, a reliance on realism in the X Men. Like the X Men are real people, not just superheroes. Yeah. And this scene was a nice way of establishing that, like these, they were all kids once, you know. They all had to learn uh, to do. It, except for Scott Summers, uh, who is just a beige uh, blob <laughs> in the shape of a human being. He was never a kid. He was born as a beige blob. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that was so unnecessary. I was trying to give him all kinds of props and stuff. And you're like, hang on, wait. I got I got to burn on Cyclops one more time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Ooh. they get to the mutant control agency. There's a bunch of escapades as they break inside. Uh, they got to like get a key first, and disguise themselves. First, we get the confrontation between Cyclops clops and wolverine who uh yeah. you, you you see like the first inklings of their competition or whatever is going on between them and wolverine's like i'm going after jubilee you and, can stop me yeah and, and and he's like no everyone has to go to this thing and then we we get the scene that you're about to talk about um yeah, I mean it's this 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 break in scene did not do anything for me. You know me, MC. I love a heist. This one did not do anything for me. I don't know why. Um I think it's just like paced a little slowly, but basically they're they're getting inside the building. Maybe it's just the cliffhanger that made this not work for me because they're getting inside and like oh there's there's laser trip wires that M- or uh, uh Wolverine can smell. I almost just called Wolverine MC. I mean Yeah. No, it well I guess Especially I guess you're short and hairy. The, when, <laughs> re- remember when you first uh, met me and I didn't have 
like my mustache. I just had like the beard. Uh-huh. I I had a very Wolverine look for a little bit. <laughs> um, listen, especially pickles. because of my um... scar. <laughs> I called you Pickles. I don't know if you heard no. me. No, I didn't. I said, listen, Pickles. <laughs> you should never have told me that. Um, so uh, they're, they're... <laughs> Wolverine can smell the lasers and they break in and everything's going smooth and they think that it's going to be okay. But secretly, uh, behind the door, there's uh, a bunch of guards who are all gingers. I don't know if you know that, but they're all like the reddest red haired men, which is very strange. And they're about to open the door, and dun 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 dun. The to be continued. Yeah. What? Well, why were all the guards ginger? Uh, mutants. Like, huh? Those are those are those are mutant guards. Um, they're actually uh, it, it's uh, it was Multiplicity Man or whatever his name is. That guy who's in X Factor. Um, he's just it's one guy who can just multiply himself over and over and over again. No, it's not really. It's just that's no, it's just how they animate. I, I know it. that, but I, I'm I'm trying to work out why. Um, no, because this keeps happening. Redheads keep showing up in like the anti mutant groups in this show. I do you think uh, that there's like some like racial something? purity thing about redheads? Yeah, it's like Weird. redheads don't have the mutant gene or something because they're <laughs> only like one percent of the population or whatever. Oh my gosh. MC's cracking it right open. The gene that passes on gingerness is also the gene that can cure mutantness. That becomes a plot point later on. There's a crossover with Spider-Man where Spider-Man's like starting to freak out, like his powers are going weird and stuff, and so he thinks he's mutating. So he goes and hangs out at the X Mansion for a while, and there's uh, somebody's working on a mutant cure, and so they send Spider-Man to go try and talk to him. But it turns out that it's just a guy working for Wilson Fisk to try and eradicate the mutants. Oh, damn. I haven't... I don't remember much of this show, but I've read a lot of Wikipedia articles about it in the past 24 hours. <laughs> well, the end credits, especially on this first oh, episode, gosh. I don't remember if oh, they're no. always like that, but it's I don't so think bad. they are. It's so bad. It's like a bad arcade video game select screen. Yeah, and every time and they click on a character, the, yeah. it shows like this cgi model of them that i'm sure somebody was really proud of but they shouldn't be listen i'm not usually here to like diminish anybody's art or whatever but these character models are atrocious they're so bad it, like if you don't know what we're talking about just look up x-men outro credits and watch them and see these terrible character models like the uh, p- uh, people's bodies extrude in places they shouldn't Beast Beast has the gangliest arms. He doesn't they... have big beefy arms. In in this character model, there's just like little spaghetti noodles hanging off his torso. They kind of look like action figures. But bad ones. Yeah. Really, really bad ones. Uh no, action figures that have been left out in uh 100 degree <laughs> heat and just melted a little bit. They, some of them have that shiny quality to them. Mm-hmm. God, Beast's arms. I just, I can't handle looking at Beast's arms. Beast's wiggly noodle arms. Oh, well. MC, do you have anything else? I mean, it's, now that you've mentioned, like, the problems and issues that they had with the animation Mm -hmm. of the show, I can kind of see it now. Well, this is, like I said, I'm pretty sure we're watching the fixed version. Yeah. But, still, there's there's only so much people can do. Yeah. It's, When someone else has, like, handed you, like, bad work, there's only so much you can do (laughs) to fix it. I think the storytelling in this show is a strength. I think the animation is okay. It's not great, but it's okay. And the voice acting's great. The voice acting is pretty dang good all the way throughout. Yeah. Um. We'll talk about voice actors next time if I have time to look them up, which I might not. We'll see. MC, I have a question for you. Sure. Question to go out on. Which X-Men do you think would give the best hugs? Best hugs? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I'm I'm trying to think about it, but um Now, are we talking across all the X-Men or yeah. just the ones in this show? You can go the greater X-Men universe. The blob. Oh my gosh, you just sink all the way in there. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's a good one. It'd be like hugging a big old beanbag well, chair. Um, the other reason I I said that was also today, while I was vacuuming, I had the TV on and um, Wolverine Origins was on. And Another good show. Or no, wait, wait, no, the movie. I was thinking yeah. Wolverine and the X Men, the cartoon. No, oh, Wolverine Origins, but, not a good show. <laughs> no, but the Blob's in that, and mm-hmm. he does so Gambit, give Wolverine kind of. Yeah, the bad Gambit. But uh, anyway, uh, like he gives uh, Wolverine a big hug, and I'm like, ah, oh, he's just sinking in there. Ah, uh, these big old hugs from the Blob. Mine would be Beast, because I feel like I'd be like hugging a real big puppy. We'll see you next time on the Best Anime Shows episode 2 of the X-Men, which is called Night of the Sentinels Part 2. Thanks for listening to the Best Animated Shows Ever, so far. Find the show on Twitter at BaseSFCast or email us at BaseSFCast at gmail.com. That's B-A-S-E-S-F-C-A-S-T. Our intro music is Funnin' and Sunnin', and our outro music is Motivator, both by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com, and licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 License. Thanks again for listening, and tune in next time. This has been a presentation of the We Can Make This Work Probably Network. Follow us on Twitter at ProbablyWork for more of our questionable content. Also, we have a website called ProbablyWork.com.